action. Okay, so we had, it was actually 11.4, the euro currency market. Now we're down to the last mini section or subsection there, drawbacks. Drawbacks. So the first primary drawback is that it's unregulated, and because it's unregulated, it is. What is the drawback? Uh, two girls, okay. It is unregulated means that it is not insured. So unregulated provides a major advantage, but it's at the same time a major disadvantage because it's not insured and therefore it provides higher risk. So these banks that have less regulations and maintain lower reserves or maintain no reserves provide for higher risk. And the risk is risk of default. So we say higher default risks. So you can deposit at home in the US and it will have a deposit insurance and it will have a government guarantee and the bank is presumably safer because it keeps more, because it keeps more reserves. These have, keep less reserves, so they have higher risks, and at the same time do not have deposit insurance. So you have two major disadvantages over here. And the other one is very simple. I've discussed it many times so far. It's all common sense. Let's write it out. It's Forex or foreign exchange risk, Forex, and Forex is the same as currency. Currency risk. So, if we got to say what the drawbacks are, the drawbacks, it is riskier. It is riskier. It is a higher default risk and a higher currency risk. Question. Drawbacks are disadvantages? Yes, drawback is the same as disadvantage. Yes, it's the same as disadvantages. Or what makes it less attractive? Before we talked about the attractions, now what's not good about it? This is the bad side of things. Okay, before I was talking about the good side of things. Okay, this completes the section. Now we're to 11, section 5. And section 5 is the uh, global bond market. Global market. For your reference, the page is 425. All right. Mm -hmm. So, it's not a section. Huge growth in the 1980s, in the 1990s, but the biggest growth of the bond market was after the global financial crisis in 2008. We are at a point where a lot of the top experts in the world, of course, this will be denied by any central banker and, of course, government, is that we now have what's called a bond bubble. Or we can say even better, sovereign bond. When we say sovereign bond, means government bond power. So now you got all countries are deeply, deeply, deeply in debt. 
The bond market is booming, skyrocketing. We like to say the bond market is growing exponentially. It is a genuine bubble. The prices go up. And investors are crazy about buying government bonds because they are scared to death out of the stock market and in re from real estate because real estate bubble has already burst. So before the stock market burst in 2000, so the stock market crashed from 2000 till 2002, and investors got totally scared out of stocks. Then they went all <coughs> in from 2002 into real estate. They blew up the giant real estate bubble, okay? The real estate bubble burst in 2008, and they learned a lesson that before, that stocks are not safe and very risky, can lose a truckload of money on, bond, on, on stocks. Then they learned that it can lose your money, your shirt, and everything in real estate. And now they are investing in the safest thing in the world, which are government bonds. Not realizing and not understanding that government bonds are extremely risky. Subject to number one, currency risk itself. Number two, part of the currency risk, we better say in, for example, if you're a German, investing in German uh, bonds, you will, are subject to inflation risk. And as are currently investors learning, they are also suffering from default risk. So you'd be expecting that sooner or later the Greek government will default, and <coughs> later on the Spanish, Portuguese, Italian, so on, default. Default risk. And here is the worst one. The worst one is called interest rate risk. Interest rate risk, I R interest rate risk, is the risk that interest rates will rise, and rising interest rates mean falling bond prices. So interest rate risk, I'm just explaining it, is the same as interest rate go up, and as a result, the principal or the price of the bond the price of the bond falls. So, yeah, bond prices can fall. You can buy a bond for 97 cents or for 100 cents or for 93 cents, and the price can go down to 85 and to 82 and to 70 and to 60, and bond prices do fall, and if you're a bond investor, you do and can take a loss based on currency, because the currency fell, or just because the money depreciated, the central bank prints a lot of money, or because you're not going to get your money back, the government will de default, or simply interest rates will go up and the price of your bond goes down. So bonds are very risky. Back in the 70s, where all currency risk materialized as dollar fell, and inflation was skyrocketing, and default was rising and interest rates were rising. Bonds were known as certificates of Ownership. Huh? Ownership. confiscation. Confiscation. You want your money confiscated by the government? Invest and buy a government bond. Certificate of confiscation. Basically, uh, when people invested in government bonds in the 70s, they lost 80, 70 to 80 percent of their money. In other words, you got back 20 percent of your money, and the government confiscated 80 percent of it. Indirectly, they paid you back the full principal, but you lost on the devaluation of the dollar and you lost on inflation. 
you wanted to buy the same car 10 years later, the price of that car was up three times already, okay? So you could buy one third of the car and you lost two thirds of your money, okay? So that's how they were known. Well, investors are way too young now and they don't study history. History has been intentionally deleted or purged from academic curricula so that people don't understand those things. And these are not well understood by most investors. Now, most investors believe, totally incorrectly, that bonds are safe. When bonds today are the riskiest investment in the world. Risk, uh, sorry, uh, uh, real estate is now, after the crash, crash safer than bonds. But they believe it incorrectly. Yeah, that's what I also learned, bonds are safer. Uh, oh, okay, well, you didn't learn correctly. You were brainwashed by propaganda and by interests that would profit by selling your bonds, and you're going to be the loser if you buy or invest in bonds. Are we talking about bonds in general or government bonds? Uh, well, right now the problem is that all bonds are getting extremely overvalued and extremely risky. So bonds we divide pretty much into government bonds and corporate bonds, and corporate bonds are getting quite overvalued. And corporate bonds are also subject to currency and inflation and default and interest rate risk. So they are also bearing all of those risks. And the interest rate premium on corporate bonds, we call it the spread, interest rate spread, which is the difference between the yield or the interest rate on a government bond and a corporate bond, is too small to compensate you for all the risks and for all the additional risks. So these aren't good either at this point in time. Yeah, if you bought them five years ago, sure, if you bought them eight years ago, you'd be okay, but not today anymore. Today, you're bearing way too much risk. So back to, back to, back to the bonds. We call some bonds a new term called foreign bonds. So, what is a foreign bond? It's very simple. These are bonds sold outside the borrower's country. Uh, the borrower's country, and they're denominated in the country where they're sold. So, you're a borrower in Germany, and you're a German company. If you sell them in Britain for British pounds, will be foreign bonds. If you sell them in Japan for Japanese yen will be a foreign bond. If you sell them in the U.S., will be foreign bonds. So that's the one type of bond. And the other type is a euro bond. <clears throat> and a euro bond will be a German company issuing in Germany a bond in some foreign currency, let's say in U.S. dollars. A dollar will do that quite often. They'll be issuing bonds when they need five or ten billion dollars financing. They'll issue Daimler. Now Chrysler will be issuing euro bonds, meaning they'll be issuing them in Germany, in Frankfurt, and they will be in US dollars. And buyers will be in Norway, and in Italy, and in Bulgaria, and of course the biggest buyers will be in US, in Asia, and even Japan. So that's what is a euro bond. Usually it's called underwritten by an underwriting syndicate. Underwriting Yeah, I'm trying to teach you a lot of finance with a lot of financial terminology. Underwriter is a bank which assumes the obligation and guarantees the issuance of a security, the issuance of stocks or a bond. And a syndicate is a group of 
financial institutions, group of banks, could be group of brokers, but in this case it's a group of banks, who work together and underwrite jointly one particular issue. So if Daimler wants to issue $15 billion of uh, bonds, it's not unlikely that one bank will handle it. Yeah, Deutsche Bank can handle $5 billion, but they don't want to take 15, so they're going to make a syndicate of 5 or 15 banks, and they're going to slice the whole issue, and one bank will take, uh, let's say, your Unicreditor will take 2 billion, Deutsche Bank will take 5 billion, JP Morgan will take 1 billion, so they slice the 15 billion into 1, 2, 3 billion pieces, and different banks, they will divide the profits between them. So, and this process is called syndication is the process of slicing the whole thing, and syndicate is the group of banks doing it. Okay, these examples, examples, these uh, foreign bonds in the US will be called, uh, let's use the red again, Yankee, Yankee bonds. Yankee is an American, Yankee bonds, and the, br the British bonds will be called Bulldogs, or Bulldog bonds in plural, and the Japanese bonds will be known as Samurai. Samurai bonds. So, very common are, were back in the old days. Uh, uh, well, even now, uh, uh, for corporations to issue bonds in Tokyo in Japanese yen, because the Japanese government was and is eager to keep the yen cheap by artificially devaluing it so as to stimulate their exports. As you issue a samurai bond in Japanese yen, after 10 years when the time comes to come to, to pay back, you expect the Japanese yen to have depreciated 10, 20, 30, 40% to have a significant depreciation so that you pay a lot less. So that's one of the reasons why you want, if you're a Daimler, Chrysler, or BMW, to issue bonds in Japanese yen. And the reason is that you'd expect that the Japanese yen would be relatively cheaper or cheaper relative to the euro or the previously the Deutsche Mark, and that will provide an additional profit, an additional benefit. Not to mention that interest rates uh, in yen are lower than they are in dollars. Okay, so that's a common reason. And now we are back to the same concept uh, that I did with the euro dollar market is attractions. So what are the primary attractions? <coughs> Number one, relatively unregulated. You don't have government interference and a whole bunch of other things. Uh, so, part of the unregulation, I can now put it subset or a separate, is minimum, minimum disclosure. Or less disclosure. If you're, let's say, an American company, want to have a bond issue in the United States, the U.S. government is killing you with disclosure requirements and all those are things you got to file reports and uh, it's, it's, it's extremely complicated. Well, it's a hell, a hell of a lot easier if you're an American ba uh, bank to issue the bond in the UK might as well issue a bulldog or it could be a euro bond in the UK and you're going to have a lot less of a disclosure requirement. And let me see what else. Oh yeah, number three, more favorable tax treatment, favorable taxation.
So sometimes euro bonds and sometimes foreign bonds will be taxed favorably. Or you will issue it, you will issue it in a place, meaning in a jurisdiction, which provides a lot more favorable, a lot more favorable tax treatment. Okay, let's see what else we got. Uh, that's this section. Let me see. I'm going to use that part of the board over here. 11.6. We're getting close to finishing. 11.6, global equity market is a very 11.6. It's important to understand that technically there is no global equity market. The, there is technically not. The equity market is strictly segmented. You got a British equity market, German equity market, Italian equity market, Japanese equity market, Chinese equity market, of course, American equity. So these are geographically separated. But you could use a global equity market by having an American company do listing in, let's say, the UK, or a German company like Daimler, Chrysler, having a listing in the United States. So global equity market would mean that you could list, and let's do list. And listing. Listing means, for example, Daimler will be listed on the New York Stock Exchange. To list means to have your company registered with the foreign exchange, comply with the foreign exchange rules and requirements, and therefore being traded on the foreign exchange. So the meaning of listing is capability to, to trade, to buy and sell it, on that particular exchange. And listing confers a lot of benefits. The big one is that it provides liquidity. You can sell a lot more shares. You can buy a lot more shares. It gives you second continuous trading. Your stock would trade in Japan for five or six work hours in Japan. Well, it will start, of course, in Australia and New Zealand. It will trade in uh, Japan. Then it will trade in Europe. And as the trading in Europe closes, it will continue to trade in the United States. So you have more active trading. You can sell bigger or buy bigger if you want. You can sell and buy bigger on more continuous markets. You can do it on the active uh, market. And the biggest benefit is issuance. Once you list on the New York Stock Exchange or in a foreign market, and the stock trades for a few months or for a few years, and you build your reputation and uh, investors get to know you, you can now issue securities on that market and you can sell them. So if you're a Daimler Chrysler or let's say BMW and you're trading on the New York Stock Exchange, you can actually sell new shares on the stock on the New York Exchange. And the issue means that you can use the foreign market to raise capital. So you can raise capital, capital as in equity. On the bond market, you will raise capital as in debt. So you can use the foreign market to raise equity capital or to raise debt capital. So what's the biggest and major advantage? The biggest and major advantage both for the equity and for the bond market at the same time is that it lowers 
the cost of capital lowers the cost of capital. So businesses, by issuing bonds abroad, can pay lower interest rates. And by issuing into a, another market, let's say foreign market, will lower also their cost of capital by having, you know, it's called the required rate of return is less. So if you're a Greek company in Greece, maybe you have to pay a required rate of return of 8% on your stock. Doesn't mean dividend rate, just required rate of return. You need to study some investing about it. But if you're issuing in a more liquid market, the market which has more capital, you may have to pay only 7 or 7.5%. 7 In general, lowering the cost of capital is well known and it's just basic common sense, highly beneficial for corporations. A corporation will always want to issue, meaning to raise capital where it's cheaper, okay? In other words, see, lower cost of capital means cheaper okay and let's see what else well that's pretty much section number six and we got the last one is fairly straightforward is currency risk or foreign exchange risk so when we say currency risk is the same as, as I wrote it over here, foreign exchange risk. And let's see what we have. Well, what we have is fairly simple. When you issue abroad, you are able to lower cost of capital. Well, currency risk can actually raise your cost of capital if you have a adverse movement in the currency. In other words, if the currency moves in the wrong direction, meaning against you, from a lower cost of capital, it can turn into a higher cost of capital, okay? If the lower cost of capital, whatever the saving is, if the currency movement will more than offset your lower cost of capital, the lower cost could turn into a higher cost. So there is a currency risk and the currency risk may not be perfectly hedgeable. So currency risk is typically hedged. To hedge means to lower the risk, to lower a risk. So if it's a to hedge a currency means to lower currency risk. And currency risk may not be perfectly hedgeable. So you can hedge most of the risk, but you cannot hedge it perfectly. So in other words, you can maybe eliminate 90% of the risk or 95% of the risk, but you can't eliminate 100% of the risk. So you should understand that if you're issuing foreign currencies, you may actually hedge it. Well, turns out that, and this is just an example with which I'm finishing today, during the, okay, yeah, sorry, before, before the 1997 Asian financial crisis, turns out that a lot of businesses borrowed, Asian businesses and governments borrowed in U.S. dollars, and when they borrowed in U.S. dollars, they did not hedge their currency risk. They were exposed <coughs> to currency risk, and as the crisis began to develop, their currencies fell, and the foreign currencies, the dollar went up. It went up relative to, let's say, the Thai currency, or the Indonesian currency, or the Malaysian currency. As a result, they turned out to be even more exposed. And they were once in trouble for their own problems, and a second time, they took a separate hit as a currency, as their currency depreciated, and the foreign currency appreciated. So it turns out that when you have foreigners borrowing in a foreign currency, for some reason they think that they would benefit by not hedging, 
And the end result is that they're going to get a, an adverse movement and they're going to get a double hit. They're going to get a second hit from the currency on top of all of their other problems. So it turns out that borrowers typically don't hedge, don't like to hedge, and things could get for the worse as it did for most countries in Asia. Now, we got similar things going on in Eastern Europe, and Eastern European borrowers in Hungary blew up because Hungarians were borrowing in Euro and in Swiss franc, and both businesses and individuals for houses, for mortgages, so that as the Hungarian foreign went down, and they got their own economic troubles, but the Euro and the dollar and the Swiss franc especially stayed up, suddenly all of their banks, all of their government and their businesses got in deep trouble, and things got or the worst, because they chose not to hedge their currency risk. Hedging is costly. Risk reduction is costly. And they chose to save on the hedging. And that could turn out to be devastating for your business. So hedging is basically a simple form of financial insurance. The meaning of hedging is insurance. Hedging is basically purchasing a currency insurance. Okay. And they chose not to purchase, just to save a little bit of money, maybe 1%. And to save 1%, they'd lose 10 or 30% as much as the currency depreciates. And that's exactly what happened to uh, most uh, businesses in Hungary. Now, we in Bulgaria have somewhat lower uh, uh, currency exposure because we are fixed to the euro. We are called, we we'll say we're in a currency board and we're pegged to the euro. But if our currency board happens to collapse for any reason, suddenly all of our businesses and banks and borrowers will get exposed to the currency risk and it can turn into a nightmare. We had, for some reason, during 2005 and 6 and 7 and 8, uh, interest rates on the Swiss franc were just a little lower than the uh, interest rates on the euro. And we had a lot of businesses borrow in Swiss franc. And a lot of individuals borrow uh, 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 to finance their mortgages, their houses in Swiss franc. And as the Swiss franc went up relative to the euro, suddenly it turned into a nightmare. They say, oh my god, before I was paying 500 euro for my mortgage, now I'm paying 600 euro because the Swiss franc appreciated against the euro. Now it's more expensive. Got to keep. Uh, you know, you got to still keep paying in Swiss franc. So, a lot of people, individuals in Bulgaria, went bankrupt who chose to borrow in Swiss franc. Well, now the Bulgarian currency is holding up against the euro, so those who borrowed the euro are not yet in trouble. But, sooner or later, as the Bulgarian currency devalues relative to the euro, all of these uh, borrowers are going to get in trouble again, probably relatively soon. I mean, it's difficult to predict exactly when and how currencies will move, but uh, knowing what the Bulgarian government is doing and what Bulgarian banks are doing, it is likely that we're going to get in trouble in the near future, maybe the next couple of years or so. So you got to be aware that with all of these foreign transactions, you're exposed to currency risk and you better hedge it because if you don't hedge it then you're speculating and you are inadvertently becoming a currency speculator and you don't want to do that with big money I mean if you're borrowing 3,000 euro to buy something fine but if you're borrowing 100,000 euro to buy your house you don't want to speculate and borrow in Swiss franc and risk that the Swiss franc will go up against you and will effectively bankrupt you, whether it's an individual or a business. Good enough? Okay, thank you.